Good evening, everyone. Uh, look, thank you very much for coming down to the Swan Yacht Club tonight uh, for our talk on all things rooftop solar power. Uh, we've got a couple of people still getting some, some drinks. Uh, but look, thanks for being here so promptly. Uh, so my name's Lee. Uh, I'm a member of the East Fremantle Car Group, the Climate Action Reference Group, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that uh, in a moment. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are meeting on today, and that's the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And I've, uh, I've heard a lot of welcome to, oh, sorry, acknowledgements of country. Um, and so one little thing that I'd like to add uh, for this one is we are in the season of, hopefully I get the pronunciation right, uh, but uh, Bunaroo. Uh, which is a sort of the second hot season and I think that's probably more apt um, using the Noongar six seasons than the traditional European four seasons uh, in Perth uh, because they know what they're talking about. Uh, they've been looking at it for thousands of years, right? Uh, and so I think that's probably something that maybe you could go away and have a bit of a read about. Um, it's the season that covers sort of February and March, roughly. Uh, it's based on uh, the season, uh, sorry, when the, the trees change and the animals uh, move around a little bit more uh, rather than the end of February because we know that summer hasn't finished. Uh, all right, so moving on. Uh, if you'd like to get your smartphones out and just search for Slido. Uh, so if there's any questions you've got about our guest speaker, Ian, tonight, uh, go to Slido, pop in this number, uh, and then you can type in a question uh, if you'd like. Uh, and if there's a question that someone's already asked, uh, you can vote for that question. Uh, and then we will try and cover the, the top questions from that. Or you can scan the QR code. Uh, so I'll just leave that up for one more moment. Everyone got that? 8482055. Uh, so given this is the first community uh, information session that we've run, uh, before I introduce our guest speaker, Ian, I uh, would just like to talk to you quickly about CARG itself. All right, so in November, following on, I guess, from the, from the Noongar seasons, I guess we are, we are here because we know that the dice is loaded. Uh, we have more and more frequent extreme events. Um, we've got some pretty bad floods at the moment over on the east coast. Had the hottest summer on record here in Perth. Um, and they, there's been multiple records broken with that. Um, more frequent uh, storm surges. The, the, as I said, the dice is loaded. Um, yes, we've had hot heat waves before. Yes, we've had floods. Uh, but we're getting them more frequently, and that's due to our uh, changing climate. The town of East Fremantle declared a climate emergency in uh, 2019. Uh, in 2020, uh, there was a motion passed to form a community group, uh, which would act as a conduit between council uh, and the community uh, in the development of the climate emergency strategy and action plan. Um, so here uh, were uh, the CARG members at the time, um, and most of those people are still involved, which is great. So just a quick show of hands of the CARG members listening around. Um, and lots of help, and Councillor uh, Tony Natale tonight here as well. So thank you, Tony. Sorry for missing your badminton night. Uh, so the climate action, uh, the climate emergency strategy um, that is gone through several iterations with Council and is about to be hopefully signed off very soon. Next week. Next week, and we'll go out for public comment. So if you're interested, please uh, have a look at that. Um, a lot of hard work from particularly Shelley and Connor uh, in the, in the uh, council team. Um, and we've got seven strategic objectives. Um, and then we've also got uh, an action plan that this is what we're here for tonight. We've decided that, look, there's a bit of work to go with council getting things through. Um, as community members, like we want to see uh, rubber hitting the road. And so while we're still going through, and council are doing a bunch of stuff already, um, that's probably a discussion for another night. 
Uh, but we've chosen energy tonight, and in particular rooftop solar, um, to, to try and uh, talk to you all about. So the specific strategy was council will encourage the community to transition to zero emissions by 2030. Uh, and then breaking that down uh, from the strategy to the action, uh, we've got to engage the community in town's energy transition story. So, as of today, 27% uh, of East Fremantle houses have rooftop solar, and that's, that has grown since we started in CARG when we, when we looked at this, uh, when we first met in November 2020, that was uh, 23%. So we've had a little bit of an uh, increase uh, over the last 15 months. Uh, and we just sneak into the top 10% in the state. But we feel we can do a bit better. Uh, our neighbouring suburbs, what do you think they sit at? Any guesses? Palmyra? Palmyra, 33? 20. 20? Close to 20. In between, actually. Uh, about the middle of the range uh, for our surrounding suburbs. So well, I think there's a bit of work for, for everyone to do there. Uh, we don't have a set target as such uh, just yet. Uh, do you think we should as a council? Um, yes. Yes? What would it be? 50? 50 at least. Higher? <laughs> Well, let's start with 50. That's good, I like it. So we don't have that yet, uh, written in our action plan. It is just engaged in the this stage. All right, so that was just a little bit about CARG uh, to start things off, but I'd like to uh, welcome Ian to the stage. I'll pass you that for a moment. Um, and I can't remember your entire blurb, Ian, so I will uh, look you up a little bit. Uh, so Ian's got over 45 years' experience in the oil, gas, uh, and nuclear energy industries. Uh, so, vast amounts of experience. Um, R&D, project management, business development, and in the last 20 years, uh, has concentrated on energy technology commercialization, uh, with the current activities being renewable energy, uh, hence him being here tonight. Uh, there's no commercial interests from Ian, none that we're aware of. Uh, and so he works for a not-for-profit group called Sustainable Energy Now, and he'll tell you a bit more about that group uh, in a moment. I'll leave that to him. Uh, and then the last bit here that he's uh, got in his bio on the website is uh, a strong belief and confidence that Australia can play a major role in the future renewables economy and is deeply committed to ensuring it happens. So I think that's why you're here tonight, to, to help the residents of East Fremantle. So if you could put your hands together uh, for Ian Boyd. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll just wind on the first slide. Um, first of all, I'll talk a little bit about SEN. Uh, SEN's been around since 2006. Can you all hear me, by the way? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, SEN's been around for, uh, yeah, since 2006. Um, we're a, a non profit uh, advocacy group, think tank, science and engineering based. Um, our claim to fame really is the modelling of the entire Southwest interconnected system. Uh, in 2016, by our own in-house developed um, modelling tools, and uh, we have actually two sections of that. We, we take uh, uh, the ability to look at insulation and wind data, and uh, then compare that with on-the-ground load demand on an early basis, and match the two together and see how much um, we need of each, and uh, the battery storage requirements, and the long-term storage, and the firming and all of that is, is uh, all modelled and mapped on an economic basis. And what we found was that by 2030, we could actually totally decarbonise the, uh, the entire Southwest interconnected system. Our whole uh, remit is really to look at both energy and transport, so we also look at electric vehicles. We're currently remodelling the Swiss on today's numbers and with the latest updates on costs and the latest technologies. And we're also going to look at things like uh, the effect of electric vehicles on a distribution feeder. So, you know, in this area, you would have a, a feeder that would come in and, and serve maybe uh, 10,000 homes, say. And uh, if 
everybody decides they're going to charge a Tesla at the same time, what effect is that going to have on the distribution? Well, I can tell you, a whole load of high-voltage fuses are going to blow, and uh, there have to be provisions in place. But software will take care of that. We know that in the future. Um, but we're going to model that anyway as a, as a way forward. So we do have no commercial interest. We're not getting any kickbacks. We're going to mention a few things that are commercial organizations here, but uh, we're not getting any kickbacks from any of them or advertising or anything like that. So we, we are advocating for the entire uh, elimination of fossil fuels uh, from the supply chains with, or the resource chains within the generation mix of the Southwest Interconnected System and all forms of electricity generation in the state. We see it as well that with electrification of motor vehicles, it's not going to happen very, very quickly because obviously it's an inflationary effect. We know that brand new uh, cars are coming in and they're upwards of $40,000, although that number is being challenged now. Um, how, how, mu how much further down it will, will follow, we, we don't know, but we do know that it's essential for the decarbonization of the system. So we, we're basically looking forward to a sustainable future as well as one for, that's good for the environment. So that really uh, explains who we are. We do do uh, uh, six weekly uh, Send Presents, um, which is an educational in the public interest uh, events that we put on. And so we'd encourage you, if you're interested in joining SEND, there's some membership applications. Just leave us your details and we can sign you up. So on now to solar PV. Um, I'll, I'll give you the basics first. Some of it will be you know, way below your interest level. Some of you may find it interesting, but I'll mention it all anyway. So systems are sized according to their kilowatt output. That is the amount of power that they can put out either into the house and the balance exported to the grid. So the electricity, as you know, is purchased in units. And one unit is one kilowatt hour, which is 1,000 watts for one hour, which if you have a one kilowatt bar heater, you can run it for one hour. If you have an electric car, you can probably power it for between four and five kilometers, depending on uh, what the car is. I don't imagine that uh, David Beckham's Rolls Royces will be uh, able to get that, but uh, something like that is about the amount you get. Um, so um, we are serviced in this state by the one monopoly synergy. Uh, is that a good thing or a bad thing at the retail level? We'd like to see retail contestability. We'd like to see retailers compete, but we are blessed with the monopoly of the poles and wires, Western power. And so that's in this state and the other states. It's deregulated with all the attendant problems of that. Of course, the government owns Western Power. They also have a responsibility to do things with that. And that is our advocacy now is to chase them and make, make sure that they do what their responsibilities are. If you sell off a grid to private enterprise, there are unintended consequences that may come from that. How do you get them to do things that benefit the, the system to, for instance, decarbonize faster or adapt? You can't without regulation. And when you put regulation in, you don't get as much of the asset. So, there's those kinds of problems. Solar panels, they're also known as photovoltaic models and uh, modules. They convert the photons that come down from the sun and transmit them into electrons through the silicon into the wiring and out into the inverter. The inverter then converts that DC direct current power into alternating current, which is the same power that is in the, in the wires coming from the electricity system. And they match it and then they provide the output into the system uh, with all the technology that's required to do that in the inverter itself. They're very sophisticated. Uh, the latest inverters uh, have software in them that would blow your mind if you really get down into the detail of it. It really is amazing. Um, and considering the cost of them, uh, they really are uh, amazing technolog pieces of technologies. Um, now, there's a comment here that you, know, you don't need a home battery. We'll come to that in the presentation. So we'll, we'll go through that and you'll, you'll see some comments uh, that might trigger some thoughts in your own mind. So the, the typical system you put on your roof really depends on your roof size. Uh, my advocacy would be put as, as big a system you possibly can on your system because they're heavily subsidized. And five kilowatt system, I saw one in the paper just yesterday for $3,800. These numbers are indicative. They're probably pretty conservative. They're from uh, public reference material. Um, they're probably pretty high. Um, I negotiated one for one of our SANE members recently. Um, for a really much lower price, about $3,700 uh, for a 5 kilowatt system. And the number of panels you get, typically 6.6 .6 kilowatts, because you can up upsize the amount of panels you put. And the reason for that is that the diversity of panels may not always face north, they may face east or west. Um, the two orientations just give you a more balanced amount of power into the system, so your home use 
or you, you know, so that you're not exporting as much. Uh, at peak, you're typically just servicing your home needs, and that's the that's the benefit of having diversity of direction of the panels. So the distributed energy buyback scheme is the system that is now uh, uh, promoted by Synergy. It's called DEBS. It used to be called REBS. You might remember REBS was 40 cents from the government and 7 cents from Synergy, 47 cents. Everybody was making loads of money out of that, so the government decided they'd have to change that. So they brought in a system now that pays you only 10 cents between 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. And the rest of the time, uh, it's 2.75 cents, which is two-tenths of you-know-what. Um, typical payback for uh, a system, three to five years. If you get the system for around 3,800, that would be typically lower, 2.8, 2.9 years for the average household. What I'll say here is that if you're somebody who's got a lot of air conditioning, then you should buy solar, definitely, absolutely, without doubt. Um, air conditioning has a huge amount of load. Heating and cooling your home is typically 38% of your overall electricity demand. Water heating is another 25%. They're the biggest users of electricity. Cooking, for instance, is only about 4%. Um, other appliances, you know, typically computers and all your uh, TVs and all of that, around 16%, etc. That's the kind of balance of the system. So water heating and heating your home are the two numbers. Now, if you don't have a lot of that, um, and you, you, you know, maybe you spend a lot of time out of the house, still buy a system that's five kilowatts because you're getting the greatest amount of subsidy. And if you're not at home using the power, guess what? It's exporting to the grid. You, you have a low bill anyway, and it offsets the network charge. So you probably end up with just a few cents um, uh, being paid to the operator for the, for the purpose of having a connection. The connections in this state, by the way, and typically around a straight, are very cheap, $30 a month for a supply charge. It's extremely cheap. It's as cheap as a mobile phone plan. So let's not grumble too much about that. It is actually too cheap, and I think there will be some uh, synergy. Will be doing some tariff adjustments, and we will see some changes in that. Probably what will happen is the network charge will go up. And it'll be typically maybe eighty dollars, but you'll get some free kilowatt hours thrown in to compensate. So um, I want to make a comment here about the curtailment. There's been a lot of talk about solar curtailment. Don't worry about it because it's done for system security reasons. Typically this happens around May and October. You may have heard of the duck curve. The duck curve is the falling level of operational demand in the system, whereby the power stations are stressed, they're, they're providing very little power, and when they do so, the revolving generators that, that provide that power, there's less of them connected, and that provides less momentum in the system, less inertia. And that is a very dangerous time. If you get a very big short circuit or a major line outage, that can cause a major problem for the system. And we can have what's known as a system black, which nobody wants to hear because system black is everything goes dead. And uh, that's a high risk time is in October and May on weekends and public holidays. And it will only happen between maybe 11 o'clock and 1 o'clock, if that, maybe even just around 11.30 to 12.30. And it'll only be momentary. So don't worry about the talent. It's not going to rob you of a lot of investment income. Now here's an interesting chart on the emission side. And uh, I want to just to draw your attention here. The most successful state in Australia in emissions is the state of South Australia. And I have to give credit to my friend Jay Wetherill, who is one of your local residents, whether you knew it or not. Uh, he now works for Twiggy, uh, doing a, a, something called Thrive by Five. And he started off the renewables revolution by moving across in 2017 when they had the, the major outage with the, with the big storm and put the big battery in. The big battery was the enabler of all of the renewables and then they went from there. But if you have a look at that, so the reason South Australia is so successful is due to that green. That represents wind. Now, if you look at WA, well, we've got all the coal and the gas and there's uh, rooftop solar is from there to there. Um, but the wind is woeful, um, and the reason is that you have to have a lot of wind in the system. Residents of, uh, of Australia have come to the party and put rooftop solar on their houses. Uh, the governments haven't been quite so quick in arranging the utility-based wind, enabling it to augment into the system, providing access to developers. They've been very slow with this, and actually Western Australia should have about a 70 to 30% rate, a ratio of wind to solar. They've got the inverse. It's about 30% wind and 70% solar. That's because residents like you have gone out and put rooftop solar on. So you can see why South Australia has been so successful, because their ratio is about 70-30. And guess what? The modeling that we did for the Swiss shows those numbers exactly. 
So that's actually validated. On carbon emissions, in, I, I want to quote now um, Bill Gates with his Breakthrough Energy Company. Bill Gates made a very uh, interesting statement a few weeks ago, and he said, it's best to decarbonize and move ahead with, with uh, renewables in our electricity system first, in order that we decarbonize everything else. As you all know, we're all sitting here with uh, you know, synthetic fibers. And you, you drive a car, and a lot of it's got plastic. Uh, everywhere you see there's plastics. These all come from hydrocarbons. In order to decarbonize those, they can be decarbonized by new processes that can go into place. You have to have decarbonized electricity first. And so for this reason, we can see here, we take this decarbonization uh, trajectory of electricity. We see here that by decarbonizing by 2030 or close to it, everything else can follow. But the bogeyman in the room is LNG. By the way, these are only what is known as the scope one and scope two emissions of LNG. If you were to see the scope three emissions, which is the emissions that are eventually uh, expended in the likes of Japan, this thing here would be way up here. We'd be talking right up there. So LNG is a bogeyman in the room. Um, transport, um, it's going to take a lot more time to decarbonize transport, as I mentioned earlier. So here we have transport, electric vehicles moving out. Um, personally, I believe it'll actually happen a lot faster because, uh, as we've seen uh, in the last few days, the events in Europe have uh, caused the price of uh, oil to shoot through the roof, and we're paying for it at the pumps. And it's absolutely insanity that here we are in WA with all these natural resources that allow us to produce renewable power, and we're driving around in cars using petrol and diesel. Where is it made? In Singapore. I mean, it's insanity. It has to stop. So, um, back to solar PV. Proprietary software used by solar, solar installers helps them to look on your roof and take very recent photographs, up to two weeks, uh, or I think it's, yeah, two weeks old um, photographs of your roof, and they can provide uh, sizing, they can look at shading, etc., and decide on your system. I do recommend solar quotes. Uh, solar quotes run by a fellow called Finn Peacock. He puts a lot of sensible comment up on Facebook and the web. On um, uh, if you if you want a, a good place to go to find out about solar, we highly recommend them. If you get a, if you put out your address and all your details, and you'll get three quotes, and you get people ringing you. You won't be pestered by marketing calls. You'll pretty much just get three. And then if you're not happy with those three, you can p pitch in again and get more three. But typically, the three that you'll get, they'll be competitive and they'll be good. So. You've got to obviously check with your local council on, uh, on known supplier problems. That's a good idea to do. Rentals, well, that's another topic altogether. It is possible to do it, but you need to speak to the landlord and uh, also you know, um, do your, do your own uh, research on that. Apartment blocks, again, same thing. Heritage buildings, um, it is possible to do it, but obviously a modern solar panel on, on, panel on a 100-year-old house can look a bit naff, and uh, you know, that has to be taken into consideration by the heritage uh, uh, regulations. Um, so East Frio PV is around 25% of households versus 30% naturally. I think it's um, it's a reasonably good uh, level, but uh, um, some suburbs, for instance, Southern River, 50% of all households have solar PV, so they're racing ahead. Um, so let's just uh, talk about what's happening in the state. There's about a megawatt of solar has been going on rooftops for the last two years. Actually, last year was a little bit lower. Probably around 300 megawatts went on rooftops last year. That's an enormous amount of power. But when you think back to the early 80s, when, um, you know, in the days of the State Energy Commission, they used to regularly look at next year's peak. Are we going to be able to meet next year's peak? Oh, we'll have to go and buy some more gas turbines. And they put more turbines in around different places to meet the system peak. Well, the government doesn't have to worry about that anymore. It's entirely handled by solar PV. And because air conditioning load is the biggest load in the state, you know, on hot days, the solar PV, the sun's blazing and heating your house up, the sun's also producing good power through solar panels. So they're very uh, well matched to the demand. So there is already two gigawatts approaching, there's about 1980 giga, uh, uh, what, 1980 megawatts of uh, solar. So, so way, by way, uh, far the biggest generator in the, on the Swiss by a long shot. The biggest next generator is the G1 generator down at Collie, 320 megawatts, so it's a massive amount of solar. Um, too much of a good thing. 
So the exist impact on the existing fleet is the duck, oops, is the duck curve, which you can see here. This is the load falling in the middle of the day. This is the uh, operational demand here. And it causes this uh, ramping of the power stations. Thousand meg megawatt ramps every day, twice. And the coal-fired units just don't like the thermal expansion. The boilers particularly have a big problem with this. And as we know, the Barnett government spent $310 million redoing Muja. And guess what happened? It ran for just a few hundred megawatt hours. And they shut it down forever because it was badly corroded. It should never have been uh, re re revamped. And the, these problems are continuing to happen even to this day. Uh, there's a lot of secrecy surrounding what's going on within Synergy, within the, the power stations. An awful lot of outages, forced outages from the 15th of December right to this day now, were happening on a big scale. So we have to see that uh, grid stability is severely affected. And for this duck curve problem, it's particularly in May and October because the demand is falling. Um, the, um, the market operator, that's AEMO, um, they have to intervene to curtail output. So Western Power actually can send signals out to all the new inverters from now on that will cut out the inverter. Um, there is five ways of doing it that they use. They use an application programming interface to go into your Wi-Fi system. So any new system you put in, you have to have Wi-Fi in the home. If you don't have Wi-Fi, you can just use a dongle to connect so that the system can talk to the internet and Western Power can intervene and do things that they need to do to, to shut down export. Um, now, electric, uh, electric vehicles, the battery on a, an electric vehicle is typically up to five times, actually even more than five times. You buy a big Tesla, um, it's about eight times bigger than the battery you actually need. So you've got mobile batteries sitting in your car. Um, and this is a very, very good thing. Um, so vehicle to home and ultimately vehicle to grid will come. It's not available yet. Uh, vehicle to home is possible. Uh, I'm about to do it myself. Um, but it, it will be on an off-grid basis. I will disconnect from the grid and provide my power for my cars. And that will provide a, a, good, uh, a good way of um, maintaining uh, my own system security because system security is going to become the major topic in the future. Especially during this transition, which is unfortunately not being managed uh, the best um, in terms of the planning. They've been very, very late with the planning and hopefully we can, our advocacy can Squirt, you know, uh, keep them uh, in the right direction um, to get the proper planning done before the transition to go more smoothly. So, EVs connected to the grid with slow and fast charges, a great asset to owners of the grid. Um, all the potential problems, engineering wise, all the problems are solved. We don't have anything coming. The biggest problem is that utilities don't like this because they're very conservative, they don't like uh, early adoption. They like, they like to be number 10 in uh, <laughs> doing things. Oil and gas industry is very much the same, by the way. Um, I've got some stories I can tell you about that, too. Um, so EV charging from home, uh, solar, and domestic systems. Uh, you can do it directly from the panels, as I do, or you can um, have it from through the inverter, plug into the inverter. And there's some pretty schmick software that if a cloud comes over, it'll cut back what's, what's going into the car. Uh, so that you're not importing from the grid and you're maximizing home consumption. So um, we need to have um, more EV policy to encourage uh, EV take up and uptake. Um, I mean, if you look at what's happening in Norway, in Norway after 2025, you will not be able to buy an internal combustion engine vehicle. In the UK, it's 2035. In Australia, it looks like it's going to be 2049 before then. <laughs> um, on batteries, now, I want to talk about batteries. Uh, home batteries um, are... I just want to ask, uh, by the way, can I ask here, how many of you already have rooftop solar? So it's a fair number. So there will be some of you looking at upgrading. Um, upgrading, by the way, just a little hint, you can't add on to your existing system legally. Um, you have to go out and rip the old one down, sell the panels for $15 each, which is insane, but that's the way it is. Uh, Clean Energy Council made that little uh, trick. Uh, the way. Uh, there's not enough caravans, utes, uh, off-gridders in the, in the farms able to soak up all the panels and you can virtually give, you virtually have to give them away. So um, home, home batteries. Um, so a lot of you would be early adopters. There are many other angles. Um, possible things even from solar uh, effects. Um, coronal mass ejections for instance could bring down the whole grid and if the grid comes down all those 330 kV transformers could get blown up by 
a Carrington style event of what happened in 1859. If it happened today, all the microelectronics would be blown. We would lose the grid. So a battery might be a good idea if you're really concerned about energy security. So, um, yeah, batteries are expensive at the uh, moment. Um, e sorry, EV, EV connected to the home is attractive, but it's not yet available at WA. It will come soon, I think. There's a lot of commercial interest in this area. There's uh, people pushing it, and uh, we'll, it will come out for sure. Community batteries, uh, we, we know about uh, White Gum Valley. That's been around for five years or more. Uh, you probably uh, have, have heard of that. And Power Ledger, uh, the group uh, um, run by uh, Gemma Green, um, they are um, ready. They're doing stuff overseas, but <laughs> they haven't been able to get into the local market. I wonder why that would be. Uh, it's just uh, the way the process goes. Utility scale batteries, um, very useful for the grid um, and very good for short term uh, balancing. You know, if a big front comes through WA, the market operator has big trouble controlling the grid because one minute you've got blazing sunshine and loads of wind, and all of a sudden the clouds come over and the wind dies down. What do you think happens to solar and wind? The amount of produced can fall off, and they do need batteries to have fast response. And by the way, the batteries can f respond a lot faster than a generator, whether it be a steam turbine or a gas turbine, it doesn't matter. It will, it will respond far faster. And the findings from the Jamestown battery in South Australia were um, were very telling. They, they made a lot of money out of the arbitrage on that battery from charging and discharging. So um, the, the South Australian Tesla Power Wall virtual power plant as mentioned there, and VPPs will come to Perth. Western Power are investigating it through Project Symphony. Uh, they're doing this uh, Southern River study, and uh, we get regular updates from that by meeting the people and getting feedback through the public domain that they um, the synergy are um, and sorry that uh, Western Power and Dalton. So, back to the conclusions. Rooftop solar is definitely worth investing in. The returns, being able to get your money back in three years, is very reasonable. And especially when you consider what you're doing for the planet, you're actually doing this for your children and your grandchildren, future generations. Um, energy po poverty is a thing. There's no doubt about that. We have to have more equity in the system so that those that can't afford it can be given the benefits of it. And uh, renters, for instance, another area. Um, I'm saying here, join the early adopters. Um, you're helping decarbonization. Prices are dropping. And by getting in the market, you're actually creating the demand that's needed. There were only like 250 batteries put in in 2020. Last year was 450 uh, officially connected batteries to the system. I think this year is probably going to be a thousand or more. Um, EVs are transformational technology, and by the way, they're not going to become a liability for the grid. They're going to become a big advantage to the grid because they will smooth out all the peaks and uh, valleys that exist on in the system. And the amount of energy that they will require, there's a lot of talk about the grid being, oh, we'll have to have a much bigger grid. I think they will be surprised with that. The amount of power that the grid can deliver across the 24-hour period is enormous. You think of all the downtime, that can be used as time for charging electric cars. So all the, all the fear campaigns going on about EVs being a threat is quite rubbish. Um, so it's a good idea to uh, electrify everything, switch away from gas. Uh, you can't decarbonize gas at the, uh, at the cooktop or in the water heater. Your know, water heating is a big part of your, uh, but 25% of your demand, but five to seven kilowatt hours a day for a uh, typical four person household. Um, PV routing is another way to go. So instead of having the watts going to the grid at 2.75 cents, have them go into a water heater. That's a PV router. And there's a company in New Zealand called Paladin.nz, if you want to take note. They do a great um, little PV router. And for about 500 bucks and a, and a static water heater, you can, uh, you can have a very cheap form of battery. It's an energy storage device. And for doing about five kilowatt hours a day, it saves you all the money for that. So get behind community efforts to decarbonize your suburb and the Swiss, build the culture, apply the science, and probe for changing state policies. Join us and help us fight this battle. We need more, we need youth, we need volunteers, and uh, there's plenty of opportunities for those that want to contribute. 
So I'll hand it over now. I've, I've had perfect enough for time. I've some questions as well. You oh, you've got the, the next ones are the questions. So some of those questions came from Slido. Yeah. Um, okay. And some questions I think have probably been answered. Um, and there's more coming through as well. Yeah. Okay. Which, which one do you think? How do we? The questions before? Yeah. Oh, this one? Yeah. Okay. Hand that round to the audience. Great. Yeah. All right. Uh, Please, thank you, Ian. Uh, <laughs> so we'll just start off with questions from the floor, uh, and then we will, if anyone would like to ask, otherwise we will go to Slido. So is there anything that anyone would like to? Yes. Yeah, well, into the mic. Oh, sorry. If you're enthusiastic about putting solar on now, but you're also very keen to find an electric vehicle with a battery that you can use, is there anything you need to do in your purchase of the solar panels to ensure you can then use the car battery? It's a very good question. Um, I'm a bit, I'm a bit biased because I've done a, a lot of home tinkering. I have dedicated panels to charge my cars, and um, those panels are not connected to the grid, nor are they converted to an inverter. But it's not for everyone. Uh, you'd have to have an interface built. To, to do that, but it is a very good way because your car just sits there and soaks up the sun. But again, it depends you, on your use. I think the new tariffs that will come out will mean that you'll be able to charge your car cheaper during the day uh, at very low rates because they want people online, particularly between about 11 and 2 in the afternoon. Um, and, um, you know, they want people charging at that time. And if you I think if you have an electric car, you can charge them. But again, it depends on your use. If you're using it to go to work, you need to know that you can charge at work. Um, but don't forget, most people only use electric cars 50, 60 kilometers a day. Uh, range anxiety is really a, it's a misnomer. And um, what I would say is that everybody's usage is different. Back to your question though, um, you, you could put up extra panels. You could have extra panels put up to service the car. And have I done something there? Oh, just, I think this is the, um, the oh. board here. Yeah. Oh, is it the board? Okay, I'll try to do that. So, um, yeah, you could have extra panels, but I mean, if you put a battery on the house, you can put up extra panels just because you put the battery in. I think you're allowed up to 10 kilowatts of panels uh, if you have a battery, rather than 6.6 it's normally limited to. You could, you could actually put some up that aren't connected yet. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you can get these second hand as well. And it's very easy to get, um, there's plenty of techies around town who will build you the interface to charge your car. Yeah. If you're looking at into getting a battery for your PV system, but you've also got an EV and waiting for the bi-directional charging, do, what do you think in terms of the timing of how likely that's going to be before we can use our cars to charge? And yeah, it's a, that's a very battery? interesting question. Elon Musk uh, recently uh, dropped a little hint uh, that the cars are already ready for bi-directional charging. They just need to switch it on. It's in this, this is just a software thing. And it, the reason they're not doing it, nobody is entirely sure, he's very cunning. Uh, he sells Powerwall batteries and Teslas. So he doesn't want to interfere with the sale of those Powerwall batteries. People say, hey, why would I bother buying a Powerwall, Powerwall I mean a Powerwall, if I've already got a, um, a Model 3 sitting in the, in the garage, it's got five times the size of battery in it, or six times the size of battery in it. What's the point of buying a Powerwall? So he'd be robbing himself of business. So he's being very cunning about that. The other thing is that the utilities are not ready for it yet. Uh, but that will come, and it will become like, uh, it will just become, ex they'll have to do it because there'll be so many people pressurizing them to allow them to do it. So I can't, I can't crystal ball gaze, unfortunately. I can't give you an answer directly, but yeah. be confident that it will happen. Uh, could you talk about uh, the efficiency of, of using heat pumps for uh, heating the water? Yep. Uh, just, yeah, compared with conventional methods. Yes. Um, Heat pumps are incredibly uh, efficient. Um, they're far, by far the most efficient way of heating water or cooling your house. Um, the coefficient of performance is the factor. The coefficient of performance of a heat pump is around five. So you put a kilowatt of energy into the heat pump, you get between four and five times that, four, four kilowatts of heat going in to the water heating. So you, it's got incredible leverage. And the latest pumps, heat pumps, have a technology known as DRED on it, DRED, which means Demands Response Enabled Device, which can ratchet down and up the amount of power that the heat pump is using according to what inputs might be required. It might come from the grid 
or it might come from the temperature outside, or it might come from your own programming that you can put into it against your own needs. So heat pumps are very good, but I would caution you that heat pumps, um, I've got a, a, they've got a limited warranty, and when you have to replace them, they're costly. Um, if you use resistance heating and a PV router, that would be my preference because it's dead simple. It's just a straight resistance heater. It lasts for 20 years, and um, the PV routing will just route. It's, the, the power is so cheap, that, and you'd only get 2.75 cents from it uh, for it, you know, exporting it to the grid. So why not just dump it straight into water heating? So it really, it's the difference between whether you want to spend three and a half, four grand on a heat pump, or just buy a cheap water heater um, and uh, and just dump excess energy in there. But look, the, I think for most people they would go out and buy a heat pump, and uh, that's yeah. It's also allowed under the building code as well. Resistance water heating can be a bit of a problem. There's uh, regulations about it. Um, just check the building regulations as well on that. Any more questions before? Yeah. Um, if you're not ready to invest in a battery, can you get inverters that are battery ready now? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, you can buy a hybrid inverter. I don't advocate it. Um, AC charging in the future will work with any inverter. So it will be AC, AC charging in the future. So it just plugs in. And uh, that's the trend. Um, so forget. Uh, having the communication between the inverter and the, uh, and the battery uh, in the future will be AC charging. But it does help to price the battery up uh, today uh, because they are very proprietary. Uh, if you buy a Fronius inverter, you're going to have to have a Fronius battery pack. Um, if you buy a Solar Edge, it's going to be a Solar Edge battery pack. Just make sure that the pricing is good if you want to add one in the future. So just to confirm, in any inverter now, will be ready in the future. Yes, because of AC charging. Yeah, that's right. And uh, just on a point on the inverter, well, while we're on the topic, um, a lot of people ask me, oh, what solar panels should I buy? I say, look, don't worry about the panels. Put the money in the inverter. Go for a high quality inverter. And I'll, I'll say the ones that I think you should consider. Um, Fronius, Germany, um, SMA, Oh no, SMA is Germany, Fronius is Austria, um, and Goodwe is a Chinese inverter. They're very good inverters. Solar Edge is another one. Um, these are all good inverters. Put your money in the inverter. Make sure you get a good inverter. It will cost you more money. Typically, they add on, you know, $1,000, uh, especially if it's the German ones. I mean, they're all made in China, but they're designed by the Germans and the Austrians. <laughs> Everything's made in China, though. <laughs> There's no more questions from the floor. I'll be able to just grab the yep. questions from Slido, please. Yeah, I'm going to jump. Or I can ask yeah. one. Yeah. Right. I'll stand back. All right. Is it better to buy a home battery now or wait a year or two for prices to fall? Uh, quite, the question really was answered in my presentation is it depends on what, how you value energy security. If you value energy security, there is a point here. When you buy a battery, make sure that it's got its UPS enabled, un uninterrupted power supply enabled. Some batteries will go down when the grid goes down. They just save you money on the overnight usage, but they don't give you power when the grid goes down. So just make sure that you, you have the UPS functionality in the, in the spec of the, of the package. Thank you, Ian. Uh, another one here, talk around sort of worth buying a battery now, or buy a battery ready. I think we've already point. answered that one. Yeah. Uh, I keep seeing ads that say that offers grants are ending soon. Is this true? What offers grants are there? Grants, uh, yes. Um, solar PV is, is um, I think it's 2027, it is when the, the grant money finishes. It started in, oh, I think 2009 or 2010, and it went for, 27 years or something, and it runs out um, the finite end to it. So at the moment, the, the subsidy is about three and a half grand. So you buy a system for three eight, it's already been discounted a, another three, another three and a half grand. Um, and every year it goes down about uh, seven or eight percent. Um, so every year you leave it that grant. But what happens is, although the grant goes down, 
It depends on the Aussie dollar exchange rate to the RMB to China, and also the, um, the deflationary impact of the technological change, because the prices are just coming down all the time. You know, in 1970, solar PV was going for $100 a peak watt. Do you know what it is today? 20 cents. <laughs> In 1977, it was $76, so it's collapsing. Now, the question will come, is that gonna happen with batteries? I think not, because the demand for lithium and all of the critical elements within batteries is very high already. There's gonna be an electric car revolution, and they take enormous batteries, so the, although there'll be a lot of development in, in the exploitation of these REEs, as they call them, the rare earth elements, and uh, critical elements for batteries, supply is going to soak it all up big time. I mean, just what's happening right now with fuel, there's going to be a, even the ABC today exploded with all these articles on. I think if you go and watch the ABC iView news tonight, it'll all be over the news about people want to do conversions of cars and all of that. Um, this is going to cause a revolution. And all the major manufacturers are already on the bandwagon. They will start to push this very seriously now. Uh, thank you. Uh, so we've talked about which solar panel, well, talking about solar panels specifically, your recommendation is not be too fussed about that, put the money in the inverter. Yeah, there's some popular brands in panels. Look, Jinko is a good one, Canadian Solar is a good one, um, uh, and there's a few others, you know, they, they, they pump them out now, and it's all automated machinery that makes them. And uh, I think it's hard to buy a, a dud panel these days. Um, it used to be in the past they'd have tier 1, tier 2 and tier 3, but they always used to fight, self, self declare and all of that. So, no, don't worry about the panels, just put a good inverter in. Lee, can I ask a question? What's the, what's the life expectancy of the solar panels and what happens to them? Yeah. And how do you know that your panels are declining in their um, efficiency now? Yeah, after, after um, uh, about 10 years, You'll notice a degradation, but it's not a lot. Um, <laughs> what I did, I just added a few more panels to take, to sort of, to take it up. Um, it's, it's, it's quite small. They say 80% after 20 years, I think it is. I think it's 80% after 20 years. Um, and what happens to the panels afterwards? It, it's an absolute disaster. It's, it's shameful. There's only re one recycling company in Australia. I think it's in Adelaide. And, uh, but there's nothing here to force you to send your old panels to Adelaide. Um, a lot of them are going to landfill. They've got arsenic and gallium arsenide in them, which is not nice. And, um, you know, that goes into landfill. Uh, it's probably another asbestosis crisis in the making if it's not regulated. And the government will have to do something. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. I've just got a follow up question from that. So we've got an existing system that we're planning to upgrade. So is it possible to keep the panels and reuse them? Not legally. Right. <laughs> but there's no reason why you couldn't in terms of the viability of panels. They're about 10 years old. No. And if you do it yourself, an insurance loss adjuster told me, don't believe any of the scam lies that the insurance company will knock you back insurance if you have a fire. If you did the work yourself, the insurance company cannot sue their own client. I'm, I didn't tell you that, but that's But check with your lawyer. <laughs> Sounds like a discussion for a drink and some food, yes. which we've got uh, after we conclude. Uh, anything to avoid when looking to buy a solar panel system? Probably the salesman. <laughs> um, anything to avoid. Um, look, they're all heavily regulated. The Clean Energy Council um, have to approve every solar panel and every inverter that goes onto the system. And Western Power are particularly uh, diligent in their oversight of this. Um, every solar panel has a barcode. When the solar panel has been installed, they upload the barcode to Western Power. So Western Power knows everything that's on the system. Um, after that, not a lot happens, but they know everything that's been installed on the rooftop. And, uh, yeah, sorry, another question. Yeah, sorry. Um, 
Excuse my ignorance, but I don't know what a heat pump is. Okay. Number two, um, I've got an old solar hot water system which is about to die. Mm -hmm. So what are, what's my best option there? What type of solar hot water system is it? Oh. Gas? Um, I, don't, I don't believe so, no. It's electric? Yeah, that's it, sorry. Is yeah. it an electric story type heater? No, it's just a tank on the roof with the panel. Oh, it's a solar hut? Yep. Okay, is it leaking or is it faulty? Um, I think the, the tank's breaking down because the water is uh, a bit funny. Yeah, I haven't been replacing your anode. <laughs> um, they have an anode in them and they've yeah, got to be replaced every 10 years. Um, yeah, uh, expensive to replace, very, very expensive to replace, largely superseded now. Uh, in answer to your question, what is a heat pump? You know what an air conditioner is? Yeah. It's identical uh, in terms of the technology. Um, but instead of pumping air, it heats water. Now, you know if you're inside the house and it's blowing cold air in the house, you go outside and it's blowing red hot air. Well, that section is called the condenser and the condenser would normally be submerged in water. So there is one side of it. And you can actually get heat pumps that work with air conditioning systems. So while your air conditioning is working, cooling the house, it's also heating the water. They do exist, and they're brilliant pieces of technology. So Friend of mine. With the solar hot water system, yeah. would you be better just not having? Would you be better just not having one and using the cost of electricity to heat the water in a hot water system? Like yes, I mean, look, PV, I mentioned PV routing earlier. It's a great way to go. So your excess. What happens is you've got X amount of sun. You've got so much power going into the house being demanded by the house at any moment. I'm talking about one moment in time and then the rest is going to the grid. The PV router looks at that and says, ah, you've got 623 watts going to the grid. We're not going to send it to the grid. We're going to send it to the water heat. And 10 seconds later, that changes, and it's one kilowatt going to the grid. Right, we'll put one kilowatt to the water heat. So it floats up and down according to the amount of insulation and the amount of demand in the house. Yeah. It's very clever, and it, it's a very cheap way to uh, exploit your excess power. Rather than sending it to the grid, put it into water heat. It's a very, very good way. And there's lots of controls on it. So for instance, when it gets up to 62 degrees, that's your maximum temperature, um, it cuts out and just exports to the grid. So nothing lost, you just export. It's a very, very good way. And you know, these water heaters, you can buy them on Gumtree for 200 bucks and get a plumber to put them in for 500 bucks. That's not bad. Wiring them up, very simple as well. You get it done when the solar's put in. Where do we get more information on the PV routers or who would install that? Talk, Where to, we go? talk to your uh, solar installer. Just remember PV routers and ask them if they'll propose it. But as I mentioned, there is a company in New Zealand called Paladin, um, and you can find it at paladin.nz. Um, the fellow that's doing it is a former Singapore Airlines uh, 747 retired captain. And he went down to retire in New Zealand and he wanted something to do, and he made the most amazing technology. And uh, it really is fabulous. And the whole, the whole um, uh, control system, he's got it like, looks like a head-up display in a fighter plane. It's quite amazing. And uh, very easy to use, very easy to operate and see what, you know. And you can add batteries to it as well. It will control batteries. Very, very clever and very cheap. Yeah? So uh, just going back to the question we asked a moment ago about replacing a um, a rooftop heating system. Yep. Were, were you saying that it would be better to replace that with a um, with a heat, a, a heat pump, yes. or to replace it with a with a cheap uh, yeah, I, conventional heat of water that goes through Gumtree? Yeah, I mean either 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 or. Um, you know, it's perfectly legal to buy buy a, a second-hand water heater, install it, um, and uh, you can get them. I I picked one up. With, I paid 200 bucks for this brand new water heater, 200 litres, self-standing, circular, this sort of size. And you just plumb it in and uh, just do away with your rooftop passive uh, solar heater. They're not yeah, very so good so in the winter, though. Oh, well, a heat pump, yeah. I mean, a heat pump costs you two and a half, four grand yeah. or more. Um, and they're very good. I'm not, I'm not decrying them. But, you know, you'll pay more for them. And the benefit you'll get for them, other than using a PV rotor, would not be that much greater. There's actually a study, if you go on the web, you can actually compare PV routing with heat pumps and do the economics, but um, yeah, depends on how you want to do it. If you've got the money to spend, just buy a heat pump. Don't worry about my tinkering. <laughs> <laughs>
was just going to mention that Synergy does offer different plans for um, yep. when, when you have, um, so you, if you've got an electric vehicle, yeah. um, and also it offers a uh, another like a green home plan. Yep. So the rates that you're paying um, between peak times, between 3 p.m. and 9 p.m., are quite high. Yes. You need to draw off the grid. Yeah. But. Um, they're cheap during the night, so yeah. you can charge your car at night. Yeah, and if you think they're bad at the moment, you want to see what they're proposing. <laughs> that is seven times multiplier between what they're going to charge you during the day to what they're going to charge you during the night. And we had a meeting with them in mid-December and uh, with the policy group, and we, we said, well, look, um, you're going to provoke people to generate in the backyard. Just have a connection. Take it from the grid during the day. Put a generator in for backyard because it's far cheaper to to generate your own power at that rate. So they went away and I think they're going to think about it. So we'll see what happens. Um, but to be honest, the utilities, they always lag the technology. They're offering the EV rate of 18 cents per kilowatt hour between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m., which is fine, except that's not when they need the load. They need it in the middle of the day between sort of 11 and 3. So why don't they do it then? I don't know. I don't know why they can't act quickly, but I think it's just the flywheel of government. It just takes a long time to get things done. Um, and also they're worried about unintended consequences and, you know, political backlash and all of that. So they're very, very frightened to change in it. So we're giving them some help and they're being very good about it. But don't forget, they've got political masters that have other agenda. And that's another story altogether. All right, we've just ticked past 8 this, this PM, so we'll... Just, just put his hand up. Yeah, sure, I'll put another couple yeah. as well. Um, yeah. Stats for the rooftop solar, that was from Western Power website this morning. Anyone who asked that? And there's another one around, are there any other community groups like this in other suburbs? Uh, Wendy looked into this recently and the answer's no. Maureen. Maureen. Oh, sorry, Maureen. Maureen. The answer's no at the moment, so we're leading this, uh, and hopefully we can get it started elsewhere. Um, uh, the question I wanted to ask you is uh, Australian carbon credit units. The government, the spot price I think is something like $60 a tonne. Now, if you uh, drive an EV, could, could one in theory claim Australian carbon credit units from the government from the reduction in emissions? Well, you might have been able to if Angus Keller hadn't pulled a pin on it about two weeks ago. So I'm sorry, a $60 a tonne's crashed. And the same thing happened in New Zealand last week. Um, so, however, um, the Singapore Stock Exchange have a company called CRX that are trading carbon credits. And some of the carbon credits may be able to be bought from Australia. So uh, can you imagine Australia selling its carbon credits through Singapore? And it's bizarre, but it's possible in the future. Um, and I think it will happen. And it will provoke something to happen here. I mean, I think Angus Taylor is going to go down with the Titanic in May, <laughs> thankfully. Uh, he's the worst energy minister we've ever had in the history of this country. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. So right, look, there are a couple of others. I think some of them have been answered throughout the talk. Uh, apologies if I'm going through and I've missed one. Please uh, stay afterwards. We've got some food. Um, go down and get another drink. And uh, Ian, you can hang around for a little bit yep. longer yep. That's um, and do some one-on-one -on -one questions yep. as well, which would be great. A <laughs> um, couple of things just to wrap up, I guess. Um, thank you once again, Ian, uh, very much. We'll, we've got a little gift for you in a moment, and oh, Wendy will do you. that. Um, just wanted to finish off with a quick plug. Uh, so I guess takeaways from this evening. Uh, got three things uh, for you. Uh, that's it. That's fine itself. It's just, just way again. Uh, all right. So, first one. Uh, take some individual action. It sounds like a lot of you already have. Um, so, a lot of early adopters. A lot of questions um, beyond just putting some uh, solar panels on the roof, which is great. Um, so, for those who haven't, uh, hopefully, uh, Ian's provided you some some motivation, encouragement. Um, Connor and Shelley are doing an amazing job, Tony and the other councillors. Um, but there's each strategic objective has a council section, a community section, and an advocacy section. So, so we're focusing on the community ones. So if you're interested, chat to any of the card members afterwards, please. 
uh, and we'll take your names down. Uh, but look, thank you very much again. Thank you to the Swan Yacht Club. Um, and just to wrap up, I guess, Wendy, a, a, a token of our appreciation to Ian and his time tonight. Um, and I think she might have one other plug as well, but thank you. Thanks, Lee. Um, yes, we have a little gift which was actually um, provided for the town of East Fremantle. And it has a pack of sunflower seeds and it's a very fine water bottle from the town of East Fremantle. But given what's going on in Ukraine and the fact we've been talking about sun tonight, I thought yeah. that would be a, a, a lovely yeah. gift. So thank you very much, Ian. Thank you very much. Um, give a plug. We've got Clean Up Australia Day. Um, I know it officially happened last Sunday, but we do ours in East Fremantle on Sunday the 3rd of April, and it's going to be a meeting at Jarrett Drive on, at 8 a.m., and we'd love some volunteers, and um, there's a lot of rubbish um, over the fence down Jarrett Drive that finds its way that's down there, so all hands on deck on Sunday the 3rd of April would be great, and we're putting on morning tea afterwards. So, and I've also got a little flyer out there for a, a movie night about um, the world's rivers, which is on later in March, if anyone's interested. Those are my two plugs. But thank you all for coming along tonight. It's great. And please, um, the town of East Fremantle put, um, has provided the, the, food, the pay for the food from the Swan Yacht Club, so we need it to be eaten. Um, please hang around and ha have another drink and help yourself to some, some free grub. Thank you. Thank you.